The presidential campaign of Bernie Sanders has revitalized progressive activism, encouraging record numbers of people to volunteer and donate. However, it is by no means certain that this effort will result in a Sanders presidency. If this isn't the scenario that plays out, thousands of activists will lose their main political purpose in life, setting up a potential exodus of progressive activists from politics. It is therefore important to have an alternative to electoral politics so that the momentum of the campaign won't be lost. The question then is what is the role of grassroots organization if a Bernie presidency is no longer possible? The answer must not be to succumb to defeatism and slip into apolitical apathy. With an impending climate crisis and with polity politics shredding the, the political fabric of the nation through polarization, the stakes are too high to do nothing. To answer this question, we need to diverge from the mainstream and take a stroll through the forgotten weeds of history. Specifically, I would like us to reconsider an ideology and method of societal transformation which played an important, if localized, role in the events of the 20th century, anarchism. No other political theory has shown as much controversy and misunderstanding as anarchism. Although it has a rich history dating back a century and a half, anarchism is commonly used as something of a dirty word and is often equated with concepts such as chaos, disorder, and pointless violence. Often overshadowed by the imposing ideologies of the 20th century, anarchism played a role in many of the important events of the century. During the Russian Civil War, the anarchist Nestor Menko led a peasant army, the Black Army, in Ukraine against the White Army of the Tsar and often against the Communist Red Army, which repeatedly backstabbed their Ukrainians. Between the World Wars, when a coup d'etat in Spain supported by Hitler Mussolini threatened the Spanish Republic, Anarchists held out against both the fascists and the connivory of the USSR for three years while forging a new society in the area in and around Barcelona. In the US and around the world, anarchists were at the forefront of the struggle for workers' rights and civil rights. Yet discussion of anarchism in the mainstream acknowledges none of these efforts and uses anarchy as an anathema by which political opposition is smeared. However, anarchism offers more than neat historical trivia. It provides a method for activism which avoids the political hackery of electoral politics and is a method which progressive activists would do well to consider. The obvious place to begin is defining what exactly I mean by anarchism. The anarchists of the Spanish Civil War defined their principles this way, quote, All anarchist propaganda and reaction are founded on the principles of anti-capitalism and anti-state. The Russian prince turned anarchist Peter Kropotkin, whose Santa-like beard cast a shadow over contemporary anarchist thought, defined anarchism as, quote, the name given to a principle or theory of life and conduct under which society is conceived without government, harmony in such a society being obtained not by submission to law or by obedience to any authority, but by free agreements concluded between the various groups, territorial and professional, freely constituted for the sake of production and consumption, as also for the satisfaction of the infinite variety of needs and aspirations of a civilized being. End quote. Basically, the goal of anarchism is ending unjust authority, but what is really of interest is how it proposes to accomplish this. Unlike many other methods of action proposed by various ideologies, anarchism is more interested with the means rather than the ends. The history of the 20th century is a history of powerful countries justifying abhorrent actions by claiming a righteousness of purpose. The record of communism and fascism needs no explanation, yet even the U.S. employed brutal methods to achieve what the government viewed its interest to be. In the name of, for the most part, anti-communism, the U.S. attempted to create a system of mind control using hallucinogenic drugs and electroshock therapy, supported dictators in the overthrow of democracies, and aided various terrorist organizations. Contrary to this, anarchism argues that the means of any action become the end, and that the method must be equivalent to the goal. For example, anarchists correctly predicted that Marxism would fail, since the goal of a classless, stateless society could not be obtained through the dictatorship of the proletariat. Instead, all that would remain would be the means, a dictatorship. As Peter Kropotkin wrote roughly 40 years before the Russian Revolution, a revolutionary government? These are two words which sound very strange in the ears of those who really understand what the social revolution means and what a government means. For us anarchists, the dictatorship of an individual or a party, at the bottom the very same thing, has been finally condemned. We know that revolution and government are incompatible. One must destroy the other no matter what name is given to the government, whether dictatorship, royalty, or parliament. We know that what makes the strength and the truth of our party is contained in this formula. Nothing good or durable can be done except by the free initiative of the people, and every government tends to destroy it. The anarchist Emma Goldman was deported to the Soviet Union shortly after its inception. She observed firsthand the effect of Marxism and wrote, it would be an error to assume that the failure of the revolution was due entirely to the character of the Bolsheviki. Fundamentally, it was a result of the principles and methods of Bolshevism. 
It was the authoritarian spirit and the principles of the state which stifled the libertarian and liberating aspirations. Were any other political party in control of the government in Russia, the result would have been essentially the same. It is not so much the Bolsheviki who killed the Russian Revolution as the Bolshevik idea. It was Marxism, however modified, in short, fanatical governmentalism. Among the other characteristics that make anarchism distinct from numerous other worldviews, anarchism is a spectrum or a process as opposed to an endpoint. For example, Marxism's endpoint would occur after the proletariat used the state to destroy the capitalist mode of production and replaced it with a communist system ruled by the so-called dictatorship of the proletariat. Republicanism's endpoint is the creation of an institution, such as the federal government of the U.S., which by delegated representatives would control society through policy. Anarchism, on the other hand, lacks such a definitive end destination and instead emphasizes a particular way to interact with society, as opposed to, for example, Marxism's set chronology of societal organizations. The basic maxim which guides anarchism is that hierarchies which are immoral and or unnecessary should be dismantled through the direct action of common people. A final key aspect of anarchism is direct action. This term has taken on many definitions over the years, but in effect, it means to act at the most immediate side of an issue and respond in the way that minimizes arbitrations, delegation of authority, and middlemen. In 1908, the following definition of the term appeared in Solidarity, a newspaper of the anarchistic labor union, the industrial workers of the world. By direct action is meant any action taken by workers directly at the point of production with a view of bettering their conditions. In short, it means organizing with those around you to solve a problem without going to an institution such as the government to do it for you. These three points of anarchism can serve as a conduit by which the activist energy generated by the Bernie candidacy can be funneled after the election finishes, regardless of whether Bernie becomes president. However, I don't think merely discussing theory is sufficient to make a convincing case for a particular course of action, so after briefly covering the origins and history of anarchism, I'd like to look at a concrete example of how anarchism has played out in history. In order to capture the full context of the example, not all of the content will be directly relevant to the political situation in the present day, but it still serves as an important example of the potential for humans to directly control society. Anarchism emerged during the Industrial Revolution as a response to the growing inequality created by industrialization. Some of the earliest anarchist thinkers included Mikhail Bakunin and Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. These were contemporaries of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, but argued against the status ideas of these communist theorists. As Bakunin wrote, anarchism, quote, rejects the principle of authority, which he defined as being an eminently theological, metaphysical, and political idea that the masses, always incapable of governing themselves, must submit at all times to the benevolent yoke of a wisdom and a justice, which in one way or another is imposed from above. This notion shaped the anti-hierarchical stance of anarchism that I touched on earlier. Proudhon, too, was instrumental in formulating anarchist thought. He shaped the anarchist view of property and by extension capitalism in his book, What is Property? In this influential book, Proudhon noted that there are two distinctly different things people mean when they say property. One meaning of property is personal property, which includes items which individuals own and are the primary users of, such as clothing, cell phones, books, waters, and so on. This type of property is good, according to Proudhon, who stated that in this context, property is liberty. However, the other meaning of property is private property. Private property includes the means of production, things such as factories, transportation systems, raw materials, and the tools used to extract them, and is defined as being property which one individual owns, but is used by many others, especially when those others are working to generate profit for the owning individual. In this context, Proudhon lamented that property is theft, since the individual, typically a boss, gets wealth from the work of others. The transition of the ideas of these men and others from pure theory to practice first came after the creation of the Paris Commune, on March 18, 1871, after France lost the Franco-Prussian War. The commune was formed by disgruntled Parisians and mutinous French soldiers, and was run partially on the anarchist principles we formerly discussed, although aspects of a representative and Marxist government were kept intact. However, the commune didn't last long, for after a few months, the French government decided to put down the Parisian upstarts before other towns got the same idea, and on May 21st, a seven-day sp street battle began, which ended with the termination of the commune and the lives of rough, roughly 30,000 revolutionaries. However, despite its short life, the Paris Commune showed that anarchist forms of organization were not abstract utopian theories, but could actually be implemented in practice and could help support a society. The Paris Commune, however, is by no means the greatest success of anarchist principles. That would come in the 1930s, during the Spanish Revolution. After the right-wing general Francisco Franco led the Spanish army in a coup d'etat, Various left-wing labor unions, political parties, and other various groups 
from workers' militias to halt the coup. Despite its lack of preparation for the coup on the part of the government, the militias were able to stop the coup in about two-thirds of the country, using guns forcibly taken from army garrisons. However, the fighting was fierce, as George Orwell described in his memoir, Homage to Catalonia, saying, Men and women armed with only sticks of dynamite rushed across open squares and stormed stone buildings held by trained soldiers with machine guns. Machine gun nests that the fascists had placed at strategic spots were smashed by rushing taxis at them at 60 miles an hour. The main organizer in the Catalonia region and in Barcelona was the CNT-FAI, an anarchist trade union and political organization. After such brutal sacrifices, its rank and file, in addition to many of the other workers and peasants in the area, were unwilling to turn the governing power back over to the state, which had tried feeble negotiations with the fascists, thus setting up the need for violent confrontation, and were equally unwilling to turn the workplaces back over to their previous bosses, many of whom had sided with the fascists. Instead, in addition to sending militias north to Aragon and west to Madrid to assist in putting down the fascist interaction, the people of Barcelona and the Catalonian countryside took their lives into their own hands, running their community affairs by democratic vote of all people, not just white landowning men, and ran their workplaces through democratic processes. The revolution met with immediate results. The transportation system became much safer, as did workplaces. Production was increased as people were working for themselves and their community instead of for a boss. However, the most important gain made by the revolution was an intangible gain, that of changing the mentality of those who experienced it. Once again, we may turn to Orwell, who fought in a left-wing militia alongside the anarchists in the Civil War for a description. There was a belief in the revolution and the future, a feeling of having suddenly emerged into an era of equality and freedom. Human beings were trying to behave as human beings and not as cogs in the capitalist machine. As he continues later in homage, one was among tens of thousands of people, mainly, no, not entirely of working class origin, all living at the same level and mingling on terms of equality. In theory, it was perfect equality, and even in practice, it was not far from it. Sadly, the revolution was ultimately crushed, as communist betrayal combined with fascist successes on the battlefield ultimately thwarted the experiment in human freedom undertaken by the Spanish anarchists. As the FAI assessed the situation in a July 1937 manifesto, a struggle against the communists was especially difficult because they were protected by Russia. Russian supplies are undoubtedly of decisive importance in the anti-fascist struggle. However, in spite of the many disadvantages the anarchists of Spain faced, for three years they proved a better world is possible. Even more than the Paris Commune then, revolutionary Catalonia provided an empirical example of anarchism in practice. So, what does this all mean for us in the present day? By concretely showing that a diverse set of people can coexist without capitalism and with minimal government, it proves that human nature doesn't prevent the cooperation of people through anarchism. This in turn is important because it shows that there is an alternative to electoral politics for activists who will either find themselves scorned by the democratic establishment, with the hostile president again, or with Bernie in the presidency, thus leaving them without what has been their guiding purpose throughout the campaign. I would like to now leave with some examples of groups that are already doing this sort of work, to offer an alternative to electoralism. The Industrial Workers of the World is a labor union which organizes anyone who is in the working class. It has been especially focused on the fast food industry, freelance journalists, and low-skilled industries that are often overlooked by larger unions. They don't sign contracts with no strike clauses, instead opting to use direct action campaigns to continuously win specific demands. My personal favorite action, among other recent activities, was at a Starbucks that refused to give workers a stepladder so they could safely carry out tasks such as cleaning, reaching supplies, and changing light bulbs. After asking the boss to get the needed equipment and continuously being denied for years before they unionized, they decided to solve the problem themselves after joining the IWW. They purchased their own ladder and affixed an IWW sticker to it which read, brought to you by IWW Starbucks Workers Union for a safer, healthier workplace. Within the hour, they were given a new stepladder by management. Food Not Bombs is an anarchist organization that seeks to alleviate hunger through direct action, in this case running weekly or monthly feeds specifically for those who are homeless. Because they are anarchist, each chapter runs things a little differently. Some work with local grocery stores to get supplies, while others fundraise to be able to provide food and occasionally other necessities. The Democratic Socialists of America also has a brake light repair clinic that many branches choose to sponsor. The intent of the program is to fix brake lights for those who have a light out to avoid unnecessary interactions with the police while building a stronger community. However, at the end of the day, to limit anarchist practices to those carried out by pre-existing organizations would be inaccurate. Above all else, if we are going to carry the momentum we built with the Bernie Sanders campaign, we need to be willing to act with those we have met and organized with for progressive change in our community, regardless of the shenanigans of electoral politics.